morning and welcome to chapel worship. Uh, this morning in reflection of all the atrocities that are taking place in Ukraine, uh, we're going to offer a piece entitled Earth Song. It's composed by Frank Tichelli. And I want to share some of the lyrics with you as it's so apropos for this terrible time that we're seeing in Ukraine. It's a sing, be, live, see. This dark, stormy hour, the wind, it stirs, the scorched earth cries out in vain. O oh, war and power, you blind and blur, the torn heart cries out in vain. But music and singing have been my refuge, and music and singing shall be my light, a light of song, shining strong, hallelujah. Through darkness, pain, and strife, I'll sing, be, live, see, peace.
Let's offer our thanks to Reverend Perry Brisbane and our university choir in Turning Point this morning. Thank you for the selection of songs and for your prayerful preparedness. It's really wonderful. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just stand for a moment and wave to each other? I know we're still being sensitive to uh, where we are in the pandemic. And also, if you feel so inclined, just wave to the people that are watching on live stream. <laughs> We have oftentimes over 50 people joining us on live stream there. Thank you very much. I, I am grateful to be here this morning, grateful to this community, and also grateful to all the people that collaborate each week in chapel. Do you know that I stand up here, and, but there's a lot of other people, more important, uh, who get this chapel done each and every week. So. Thank you to our friends from Media Services, Kevin and Paul. Thank you for each and every week, your diligence. And, and Sean for live streaming, right? This is a new concept to us. We're doing it well, so thank you, Sean Douglas, for your help. And what would worship be without PowerPoint? No, no, but uh, we're thankful to Ella who's been our chapel administrator this semester for doing all the coordinating with the PowerPoints and, and slides. So thank you, Ella. And yeah, sure. Thank you, Ella. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Josh Gunter, who's kind of the person on the floor here every week with our chapel worship team. So thank you. Thank you. You allow us to gather as a community each, each week. So it was Friday. March 13th, 2020. Do you know where you were? I know where I was. I was called into a meeting with student development staff in the Baird Library in Walton Hall because we, were, we had to discuss this disturbing news about a virus that was particularly impacting the West Coast at the time, but seemed to be growing ever so much. And what would we do? what would we do as a student development staff, especially when we're thinking about students and thinking about academics and co-curricular activities and all. I can remember being at this table, not knowing really what's happening, and thinking to myself, it may just be a few weeks we have to do this, right? We may have to shut down for a few weeks, and then basically we'll be back and finish out the semester. Well, what a journey it has been, right? What a journey it has been. 
with all the disruptions and disappointments and worry and anxiety and concerns, suffering and death, it's hard to imagine it's been two years, almost to the day that our community went through, persevered, worked together, collaborated, and also experienced a lot of worry and anxiety. A lot of worry and anxiety. I can remember um, students really exiting very quickly from campus. Some of you will remember that personally, leaving many of their belongings still in the residence hall that weren't claimed until summer because we wanted to get them off campus. I remember I was told, I was teaching a class in the spring semester, just take everything, Joe, with you, because we don't know if you're ever going to be back in your office. I didn't get back to my office until sometime late July of that year, from March to July. Right? Uh, administrators were doing everything they could about the viability of the university. How are we going to keep things moving in a good direction? Staff were helping with regards to offering critical services, like what about our mail? We have things shipped to the university. What are we going to do? Right? All those questions, right? And then there was Zoom. <laughs> and it's still with us, Zoom. Thank God for our wonderful colleagues in the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Technology. They became um, the fourth part of the Trinity, so to speak. They were just like Father, Son, and Spirit, and the Center for Te uh, teaching, learning, and technology, right? The only Zoom I knew before the pandemic was looking through a microscope in a biology lab or something like that. You want to zoom into something, right? I didn't know anything about Zoom, and we, we learned all these new phrases during the pandemic, didn't we? New normal. Social distancing. As an Italian-American, that's so anti- kind of humanity to be socially distanced with people. No more hugging, right? Unprecedented is another word. Contact tracing. What an interesting, right? How about frontline workers and many other, many other words were introduced into our vocabulary these past two years. And what is the number one repeated slogan regarding Zoom? What's the number one repeated slogan? Re You're on mute. Right? If you said that in any other context, that would be such an embarrassment. Or, you know, you, it would be an insult to say you're on mute. But no, in Zoom, you're on mute. I remember contacting President Matthews. I'm sure he remembers this. Um, because what we were going to do for chapel. So we pivoted, right? We got, uh, we, we had to exit quickly. And what we would do for chapel the following week, we knew it had to be virtual. We knew we could not gather like we are this morning. And we knew we had to bring our community together. So I remember speaking with President Matthews, and literally I had no ideas, which is always a good conversation with President Matthews, because he always has a good idea. And uh, we, we didn't know what to do, and we thought, why don't we read through the Sermon on the Mount? Right, take turns reading the words of Jesus. The Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. It takes about 20 minutes, which is an ideal homily, an ideal sermon, and that's what we did. You can go online and watch our first chapel. I did, I did that in preparation for this message. It's Wednesday, March 18, 2020. There's no music. We didn't know how to do music, worship music at that time. We gathered people together, and you could see students are home in all different places, and, and, and we had you know, close to 100 or so people there. President Matthew said a few, and then we read through the Sermon on the Mount. I fumbled trying to share a screen. You can see that in the early days of the pandemic, right? And I remember, too, that I didn't know this at the time, but looking back at it, my webcam on my laptop was so terrible, the way I looked. So that could have actually frightened a number of members in our community. And I didn't know this until I got a package two or three days after. It was a package I wasn't expecting. It was wrapped almost like in brown paper bag. I thought maybe we should have uh, the police take a look at it and open it. It was from Eric McCloy with a new webcam for my laptop. He said, Joe, please use this camera. That was all that was in 
and he saved my reputation. I am still the university chaplain today because of Eric McCloy, because I didn't know how I looked on Zoom. You know, the expression is, it often seemed like we were building the plane while we were flying it together, all together as a university. Since the pandemic, just a kind of FYI, <laughs> believe it or not, we've done 50 chapels using Zoom. And we're grateful to be in person and also on live stream now. God has been faithful. It's been difficult. It's been uh, unimaginable in some ways what this community had to do. But we're here today, two years after. Now, there was one word that I heard repeatedly during the pandemic, less so now, that I want to focus on this morning and see what the words of Jesus might help us with. It became almost as popular as the word Zoom or you're muted. It's a five-letter word with two vowels, the vowels I and O. Now you think we're going to play the game Wordle, right? That's what we're doing, right? We play it. The Modica family plays it almost every day. I'm awful in it, but I still participate as a member. Do you know what the word is? It's a five-letter word with, with vowels I and O. Maybe I'll give you, and it has three consonants, obviously, and it's synonymous with the, the word or the phrase to turn or to twist, to turn or to twist. Not a lot of pivot, pivot. We have some wordle players, that's great. It is the word pivot, and I believe this word has been used abundantly the last two years. Let me tell you how the, cha uh, the, the Chambridge, uh, Chambridge Dictionary defines pivot as a verb, right? We're talking about pivot, pivoting. To turn or to tw twist. To change your opinions, statements, decisions so that they're different from what they were before. And then thirdly, to avoid talking about something by talking about something else. To pivot. Now, it sound, that sounds like a lot what I did the last two years. Pivot. Right? You make plans going in one direction, you hope in one direction, and then 24 hours before you're going to do it, you have to change plans. Right? Think about all the emails from our community that we received in two years. And they were really good, important emails, but how often the email that came 20 minutes ago talked about the email that was sent yesterday that we need to change something. Right? Now, we can, we can complain about that, because, oh, the university doesn't know what it's doing. But in some ways, who knows what they're doing in a pandemic? In some ways, we're, we're, we had to pivot given what was presented to us in a given day, week, month. I can remember we, we had a grandchild born during the pandemic. Talk about pivoting. You know, I like to go to the hospital when a grand, grandchild is born. And I hope my daughter-in-law likes that too. We have three grandchildren, it's our third one. So I was ready to go. And my wife was saying, you can't go. You can't go because of the restrictions. You have to pivot. So you do the Zoom thing for a while. And then we, we finally got to see Emmett. But it was weeks after, right? We all had to pivot. We needed to pivot as a way of survival in some ways, right? We needed to be flexible, malleable. I think we're in a different place, hopefully in a different place today. Now, I'm not a prognosticator. I'm not giving any predictions of what the future holds. But we've been pivoting. We've been pivoting. And now I want to give you another verb to use, to begin to use. We've been pivoting, but I want to give another verb to use. And it's, from, it's a verb that Jesus gives us, a verb that Jesus gives us. And yes, um, well, not maybe you may not know this, but ironically, I'm going to turn, return to the Sermon on the Mount. So um, I'm not asking President Matthews to come up and read it with me, so don't worry. But I'm going to take a look at the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of Jesus. Um, I believe that Jesus' teaching is essential for living, that gives us the windows of what it means to be a human and what it means to understand what it means that God came in the flesh and dwelt among us. I take it very seriously, the words of Jesus. I may not always obey them and understand them, but I try to, I try to live into the teachings of Jesus. So the Sermon on the Mount, you may know, is found in the first 
book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew being one of the followers, original followers of Jesus, and it's a wonderful sermon that was given on a mount, right? Jesus is teaching disciples and the crowds. He's teaching. He's seen as a teacher of Israel in this gospel. And he goes up a mount. Commentators often mention that he's mimicking in a way that Moses went up the mount to receive the Ten Commandments. Jesus now is offering a new Torah, a new Torah. And here's the verse I want to focus in on. It's a very familiar verse, and you know this verse very well. But strive first, this is Jesus now teaching, strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. How many of you have heard that verse before? Very familiar. I'm sure there's a worship chorus or a hymn that actually utilizes this verse. Do you know where this verse is found in the Sermon on Mount? What passage it's embedded in? It's almost like uh, Jesus paused for a moment and said, if you do this, you'll eliminate this. Do you know where it's embedded? What section? It's embedded in the section on the Sermon on the Mount that talks about worry and anxiety. Worry and anxiety. Now, Jesus is not a psychotherapist, or he's not someone here giving a prescription, but he's saying you have this worry, right? You worry about things, and he says, look at the birds of the air, the flowers of the field. Look at how God takes care of all of the things you see around you. And then he pauses and says, remember to strive towards something. Remember to strive towards something. It may not eliminate worry and anxiety completely, but it might help to train you to pay attention, to pay attention what God is already doing. So the, the title of my chapel message this morning is simply from pivoting to striving, from pivoting to striving, let's do this together. Let's do this together. And this is a pastoral message, not, not surprising since I'm the university chaplain. This is an insider message, right? I'm talking to us, right? I'm not talking about a particular issue beyond our community. I'm not talking about um, anything in our own society, but I want to talk to us pastorally this morning. I think we need to reframe ourselves. Rather than pivoting as a default position, I think we want to now move into striving. We have to literally pivot from pivoting, and that pun is intended. That was intended there. So let's talk about striving. What could Jesus possibly mean by striving? Um, Right? Pivoting has a lot to do with turning and changing direction, right? And, and now what does Jesus mean by striving? Well, striving implies making an effort in a particular direction, right? It means to choose to go in a particular direction. The Cambridge uh, Dictionary says to try hard to do something in one direction, to make something happen, especially for a long time or against any difficulties. Isn't that interesting? Jesus says strive, but he's giving us the parameters in which to strive. Do you see? Strive for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. That's what, we're, that's what we need to, to strive towards. It's interesting to me that that's what Jesus says. He says, if you strive towards the things that will give you hope, you will not be worried you will not be anxious. If you strive towards the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, as we understand it, in our present day culture, you will be my disciples, you will be my followers. And I've been pondering that a lot because sometimes when you think of the kingdom of God, you think of a place, like, let me point to it like a place, like on Google Maps, if you typed in kingdom of God, where would it take you, right? That's not what Jesus is talking about here because Jesus already has brought in to our time and space the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is already present, right? It's not like we have to carry it with us everywhere we go. God's already at work in every place that we encounter. The question for us, I believe, is to pay attention to what God's already doing and coming alongside with humility, with hopefulness, and with the ability 
to do it together will help us as a Christian community, right? We don't bring God with us as much as God is already at work because of the, the ministry of Jesus. Jesus has already entered our time and space. He's already begun the kingdom of God on earth. And our goal as followers is to, is to come alongside that activity, that work. But here's a key point. You, know, you ask yourself, what was Jesus' first message when he began his ministry? Well, um, Matthew reports in the previous chapter, Matthew 4.17, he says, when Jesus began to preach, this is how he started. Very simple. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has has come near. Now, repent is not a word we particularly like to use, right? You know, I used it when raising my children. I tell them, repent. No, I did not I didn't say that. That was not my good parenting skill. But, right, when is the last time someone or you felt you had to repent of something? It's not, it's not a word we sometimes embrace, although we can read it in Scripture. But it's interesting that Jesus says one way to begin the, the striving to the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, is understanding our own sinfulness, our own brokenness, the need for reconciliation, that repentance is something as a response to the values of the kingdom of God. And I've been thinking for myself, when is the last time I repented of something, right? I mean, thinking about, is this, this has to be more of a discipline as I begin and continue my journey with Jesus. And repentance is not simply saying you're sorry, although that's always a good thing. It's really changing your attitude, changing a way of living in the world. And this is what Jesus is asking. And we're in the season of Lent. And the season of Lent, fundamentally, at least unless I'm reading it incorrectly, it's a season of repentance and renewal. That's we're doing this together. We recognize our shortcomings. We recognize our own finitude. We recognize how we can be hurtful at times, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And what do we do? We ask for forgiveness. We ask to be reconciled. We repent, Lord Jesus, to give us of our sins. That's kingdom value. That's not guilt. I'm not making it hope. Hopefully it's not guilt-driven. It's kingdom-driven. It's kingdom-driven that we ask for forgiveness. Repentance here is the true pivot. If you want to know really what a pivot is, Look at the way in which repentance should move us in a different direction. So the kingdom of God is already here at Eastern University. Do you know that? It's in the residence halls. It's in the dining commons. It's in every meeting. It's in every classroom, even when the professor keeps you a couple of minutes after. The kingdom of God is present. As a Christian community, it's our responsibility to respond, to strive towards those kingdom activities strengthen our own lives, but also to strengthen each other's lives. Wouldn't it be wonderful we just striving together, like everybody striving together for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. Now, the word righteousness may be a little bit misleading here. And I see, a, I am teaching the Sermon on the Mount this semester, so I see a couple of students who will probably correct me on Thursday's class. Because I say things, you know, you have to figure out, is he really telling the truth here? But uh, we went over this, right? Alexa, we went over this. Jabri's in the class. Uh, oh, yeah, Ailey's in the class. How many are, well, we got at least three out of the 14 students. I should have required them to be in chapel this morning. Who knew? We talked about the concept of righteousness, not simply a spiritual term to say that we have a right relationship with God, which, of course, it includes the vertical. Through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled with God. We have righteousness because of Jesus. But you know what righteousness also implies in that text? Justice. Justice. That it also implies a horizontal relationship so that in our righteousness with God, we strive towards justice. We, st we strive towards working with people, working with marginalized people, forgotten people. We work towards giving a, a sense of justice in all that we do. Doing right. Christians need to do what it's right, what's right. Isn't that wonderful? That is what righteousness is. It's not simply a spiritual gift that we get. It's something that gives us a responsibility. We need to do something because we've been made right with God through Jesus Christ. Striving, striving, striving. Some of you know about the Yacht Club, 
right? It's one of our campus ministries, YOD, for those maybe on live stream. Uh, it's an acronym for Youth Against Complacency and Homelessness Today. It, I was fortunate to talk with students when they were thinking about this. I say fortunate because they were striving and I was asking a lot of questions. Like, are you sure you, want, you can do this? You know, what's happening here? What's happening there? It was started back in, in the mid-90s by Shane and Mike and Michelle and Brooke and Jamie all coming to my office saying, we want to do this, Joe. We feel called. We feel, they didn't use the word they feel like they're striving, but they're looking for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness among those who are experiencing homelessness in Philadelphia at the time. During the pandemic, they celebrated their 25th anniversary, a, a ministry of, that started by students. I didn't come up with, most of the things that students come up with last, many of my ideas, it's, it's in the archives. It's, it's forgotten. Isn't that, and that's fine. I think that's great. But 25 years of the Yacht Club, and some of you have participated, is flourishing. It continues and I would say it continues because students knew how to strive, right? They were striving. They were doing Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. 25 years of striving. And there have been good semesters, perhaps, and maybe difficult semesters in any, in any kind of ministry or any kind of relationship. There's going to be difficulties. I don't want to paint a rosy picture here, but they learned how to strive. So... Bringing this to a close, let's talk a little bit about this. What does this mean for us today? I hope we will not use the word pivot, that we're always pivoting, because we basically may not know where we're going and what we're doing. And I hope we'll replace the word pivot for striving. What are we striving to as a community, as a community? We can look at this individually, but I don't want to make it only about individuals. We need to strive together as a Christian university. I know I've had some conversations over the last several months about Eastern University's religious demographic, right? What's the spiritual temperature on campus, Joe? I, I get a lot of those questions, like, what's happening? And, and you know, quite frankly, I don't always know. I can... I, I, I talk to a lot of students, and, and certainly demographics change, right? We know that just sociologically about types of students and w why they would come to a Christian university and so forth. But I'm thinking this. One of the great gifts we can give to all students that come here, even those who may not necessarily confess Christianity or may be skeptical, maybe they've been hurt by the church, maybe they're fearful of whatever, Right? I mean, there's some really good reasons why people push back against Christianity for some really good reason. Maybe if we as a community show them what it looks like as we're striving together, that would be a great witness, a great model. Right? How we treat each other, how we strive to see the kingdom of God in our midst, in the small and the larger ways, and how we strive towards righteousness, right? A sense of justice. I think it's more about paying attention than doing more. I don't think we need to do more. We, we're doing a lot. <laughs> it's not something you need to add. You just need to slow down a little bit and pay attention. God is trying to get our attention. God wants our attention. And believe it or not, once we give God's attention, give, we give attention to God, it's amazing what you start to see. And, and it's a hopefulness. It's a, it's a way of understanding God hasn't forsaken us, even through difficult times. God doesn't want us to be riddled with worry and anxiety as disciples. He wants us to be hopeful and be realistic, but hopeful in that realism. Jesus says in a whole passage about worry, don't worry, don't be anxious for tomorrow, he sticks this teaching in it. Just strive. No way you're striving. Strive first for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, and God's righteousness and everything else will be added to you. Now, you're probably wondering, wow, what's that? You know, what is that? I don't know what Jesus meant by everything will be added to you. Does that mean like God's this ATM machine? If you just have the right code, everything starts to flow. You know what I do think it means? 
God will provide. God, God will take care of us. It doesn't mean that God gives us everything we want, but God gives us what we need. And that's hopefulness. And some of us need that hope this morning. Let me offer one other way that I've been trying to strive. Right? Um, we need role models in our lives, right? We need people who really strive well, and you kind of model yourself, or you think about how they're striving. You know what I've been doing recently? I've been reading about the saints. The saints. Meaning that, uh, you know, I'm not the first Christian trying to strive, so I'm looking at that cloud of witnesses that God, God's given us these resources, certainly scripture, but I've been reading through a couple of resources. One is that I, every day it's called Blessed Among Us, Day by Day with Saintly Witnesses by Robert Ellsberg. And again, if you email me, I'll give you the information. But every day I read about a saint, somebody who was striving towards the kingdom of God and God's righteousness. I found that fascinating. And it doesn't matter, you don't have to be Roman Catholic or Orthodox. We all should believe in the cloud of witnesses that surround us, that give us encouragement, that help us be able to live the Christian life. There's another one. And we had this wonderful speaker on campus a few weeks ago through the Honors College. Uh, Karen Wright Marsh has a wonderful book called Vintage Saints and Sinners. And she talks about 25 people in the Christian tradition that can give one inspiration, how they live and the commitments that they made. We need role models. And maybe for some of us, we need better role models. Because sometimes we can be gravely disappointed by some of the role models we see currently in Christianity. It's important to strive. And we don't do that ourselves. We need to realign ourselves during the Lenten. We need to cal recalibrate a little bit. We need to trust in God. And I know that sounds like a bumper sticker, but we really do. We need to trust in God. God is with us, and we need not to succumb to busyness or apathy. Uh, God gives us the strength to give us hope together. The pandemic, painful as it is, has taught us things. And I hope it's taught us as a Christian community to be able to strive towards the things that God has given us here at Eastern. Look for the tangible ways for God's kingdom and God's righteousness to be present. We have our hope in Jesus. We need not to be captivated or consumed by worry. Do I worry? Absolutely. Right? We have worry. That's part of our makeup. I don't want to be consumed. I don't want to be identified with worry as much as I'm striving to trust in God. I'm striving to see how the kingdom has already come in our midst and to come alongside it, to trust God's activity in the world and to strive towards justice. We have a lot of banners around campus with courage, don't we? Right, courage to this, courage to that. I love to see a banner, courage to strive courage to strive. The closest we have is courage to thrive. So maybe I'll go up the pole to change some of the letters. If you see me up there, do not call security, please. I'm just changing some of the letters. I think we need to courage to strive. Courage to strive. Maybe we can, I can rewrite the beatitude. Blessed are those who strive, for they will discover God's kingdom and God's righteousness wherever they are. Why don't you please stand, if you're able, as we close out chapel this morning. Thank you for your attention. Um, I would like to pray the Lord's Prayer, which is also found in the Sermon on the Mount, right? And it's found in such a way that I think if we understand the Lord's Prayer, we even understand better what Matthew 6.33 is implying there. So I'll lead us and we'll pray it together and then you're dismissed. And we'll use debts and debtors as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. Thanks again to Turning Point, our University Choir, Reverend Brisbane. Have a good rest of the day and keep striving. Keep striving.